Having said that, let's jump directly into the conversation. The topic is ever more important and facing all of us. At the time of the pandemic and at the time when the global economy is suffering from sluggish decline, what can we do together? Today, we're going to focus on several issues. For example, even during the COVID-19, what can we do together in terms to promote trade under the current circumstances? China has put out its five-year plan. How can we all take advantage of that and promote cooperation on a wider scale? How to move forward with the WTO reform and also the regional mechanism? Meanwhile, how can we all participate in global cooperation platforms such as that working against the climate change. And I'm sure you have your wonderful and brilliant ideas with us. And I'm so honored to introduce this absolutely strong panel. All your excellencies joining us today. Ambassador Ferrari coming from Italy. Ambassador Chapias from the EU. Ambassador Billy coming from France. Ambassador Sugo from China. Ambassador Barton from Canada. Ambassador Siri Jala from Finland. Ambassador Osman from African Union. Ambassador Bukelfa coming from Algeria. Ambassador Fletcher from Australia. Ambassador Geertz from the Netherlands. And also we have Ambassador Zajakowski from Poland. I hope I pronounced Ambassador's name right. Thank you. Ambassador Monsalvi from Colombia. Did I have everybody there? We also have another ambassador, Ambassador Spain. Ambassador um, Descala. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. So we have limited time for such a strong panel, but we love this inclusive format. It only demonstrates the strength of globalization and the proactiveness of our international diplomatic community here in China and the willingness to establish bridges among all of us. So let's jump start right into the conversation. I have one discipline machine, if I could explain a little bit. Since time is limited, everybody have three minutes or so for the first round. If your time is up, I would just gently knock on it you will hear the sound. All right. So let's go with the regional. Ambassador of African Union first. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. Uh, although the debate about globalization is not a new one, it is particularly more important at this juncture. If support for liberalization, for price trade, and integrated global economy were to suffer a significant setback, the consequences could lead to slower economic growth and lower living standards around the globe. No doubt that trade openness has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of extreme poverty and still a greater number await to be alleviated. The tension we are now seeing in the international trading system have been building over decades. The agreed multilateral rules were not well respected. That high levels of state support and protection remain in key sectors Support to agricultural producers remains high with over two-thirds provided via measures 
of the distort protection of trade strongly. So reform is needed. There are also growing concerns about rising government support across a range of industrial sectors, and that new rules were needed to ensure a level playing field. Having said that, I would like to concentrate on one area. That is the impact of globalization on the LDCs countries. I'm coming from Africa, and the largest number of LDCs were in that continent. The cracks in the international order and the trade war compounds the stress on multilateral trading system, which was already, already struggling due to lack of progress on talks at the WTO. Bilateral trade and investment agreements have multiplied in recent years, particularly those involving developing countries. Without multilateralism, LDCs are compelled to accept terms offered by developed countries and more powerful economies, rather than strike deals collectively as part of a block using accepted rules. Rich countries are negotiating mega regional trade and investment partnership, and this will lead to the erosion of the value of existing schemes for least developed countries and forcing on agenda WTO plus issues, which is contrary to the interest of the LDCs. It is envisaged that unless trade partners change LDCs will export far less to Europe under EBA, everything but arms, or even to other developed countries in general and their other trade preferences schemes. Only a third of LDCs export, or exports come from Africa, mostly unprocessed commodities. This situation has led LDCs to trade more with each other and with neighboring countries. The African Union, the newly introduced African Union Free Trade Area, signed last year, will boost intra-African trade. The rise of South-South commerce is already hurting the end of an era in which trade preferences were dispensed by developed world to passive recipients. Due to all these hurdles for the people of the LDCs, Revitalization of multilateralism is a matter of survival. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Master. You set a great example for all the gentlemen over here about timing. And thank you also for talking about it's not just the powerful countries making the decision, but rather should be a collective decision when it comes to trade and multilateralism. Thank you. Now let's go to Ambassador of the European Union, Ambassador Chapias. Three minutes for you too. Thank you. Thank you, Chen Wen. Dear colleagues, what an assembly of minds. Exactly. Uh, a few days after the US elections and the uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party plenum. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic did what protectionism could not do for years. It did what anti-globalization advocates could not do for decades. It revealed the shortcomings of globalization from Washington to Brussels to Beijing. And some are already talking about de-globalization, decoupling, like if we were going backwards and not forward. Now next week the G20 leaders will be meeting and uh, the order of the day is recovery, global recovery. Uh, the G20 is representing two-thirds of the global economy. And the question for them is to decide how to macro-coordinate their national plans. For the European Union, clearly, we think that the new economy, post-COVID economy, will be different from pre-COVID economy. It has to be green and digital. We need to invest in the future to create the leverage of growth that future generations will need. 
China will come to the G20 with a lead because China is the only economy in the world that already is showing signs of recovery. And all eyes will be on China, especially after President Xi's speech at CIIE, how China is going to walk the talk of openness at a time when all major economies are suffering. What is dual circulation? I think that will be, there will be a lot of conversation about that. We in Europe have three main objectives, targets in the next few weeks. First, we need to keep trade, global trade, open. And this is not self-evident. For the European Union, in the next 10 years, 85% of growth will be external. We need to plug in with all our partners. But if our partners close up, then we are in danger, serious danger. Two, it is high time to reform multilateral organizations that have failed in the last few weeks or months. WTO is in danger of death. And we do hope that President-elect Biden and his administration in January will take urgent steps to unblock the appellate body of WTO, designate the new DG, and begin consultations with China, with Europe, on reforming WTO rulebook. Because if we don't have WTO anymore, then we are all in danger and the first who will suffer is China. Because China has benefited from WTO much more than everybody else. And the last point I want to make is that the big question, and this is the question China is asking itself right now, is to strike the right balance between autonomy, resilience of our economies, and open trade, open and free trade. What will be the new balance? China says dual circulation. Well, we need to, to see what it means for our businesses. Uh, but the thing is, if we continue to go on the path of the last few months of big power competition, then let me say very clearly that we are all going to fail. So we recover together or we fail separately. I thank you, Mr. Ambassador, right on time. Thank you. You talk about the importance to opening up, but at the same time to deal with the challenges of COVID-19. You talk about various balances both China and the world needs to walk at this critical time. I want to thank you on that. Hopefully, we're going to hear more about how the European Union is going to do it. Thank you. Now, before we go to the next speaker, which is coming from a specific country, I would also like to say a few words about observers that are present here today. Due to the limited uh, uh, seating and due to the limited time for the session, we have a whole round of various uh, wonderful ambassadors who are very instrumental in their contribution, building a bridge between their countries and China, also with us here today. But they are here as observers. I want to also acknowledge them for their gracious presence. Ambassador Romuato from the uh, country of uh, Gabo Verde. Good to see you. Nice to see a sister over here. <laughs> Ambassador Chandaka, coming from Ethiopia. Ambassador Kalandia, coming from Georgia. Ambassador Misri, coming from India. Ambassador um, Duryev, coming from Turkmenistan. I hope I pronounced your name right. You were coaching me during the dinner. And also, last but not least, uh, Ambassador uh, the Hari coming from United Arab Emirates. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your presence here, and lady, of course. Now, let's continue. 
with our individual country and their representatives. Since we are hosting this session in China, let's go to Ambassador Su Go uh, for the representative of China. Ambassador Su, good to see you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Tianwei. And also, so congratulations to uh, Hui Yao uh, and the CCG for choosing this very important and, and uh, timely uh, topic. Well, I uh, am honored to be invited to, to participate in this panel. However, I doubt whether I can represent <laughs> uh, the, the whole of China. Only uh, with this uh, opportunity, I would, only, I would like only to offer a few personal uh, thoughts about this. As we all know that uh, the eye-catching 2020 presidential election in the United States is unfolding. However, everybody in the world, if I may, to choose a word from the English arsenal, we are still waiting until the dust to settle. That's why you can see that some countries have offered congratulations and why others are still uh, following the formality of international uh, conduct. Uh, but then we, uh, as for uh, the, my uh, personal uh, undertaking, I'm ch uh, also the uh, co-chair of uh, PECC Pacific Economic Cooperation and uh, chair of the uh, president of the China side. Of course, our organization is engaged as all uh, known that uh, engaged in the promotion of international and regional economic cooperation. Well, uh, our thoughts and uh, our actions are printed in our, uh, uh, in, in our website and so. Uh, therefore, I, I would like just to use this limited time to just offer you a few thoughts, personal thoughts about the relationship between the future relationship between China and United States, a topic I'm, I'm sure that everyone is uh, interested in. Well, with regards to the future, it seems to me that there is no reason for euphoria. However, but one can predict with a good common sense and reason that there could be a window of opportunity for Sino-US relations to return to normal, or at least to come to a halt to the downward spiral or escalation of tension. There could be an opportunity for dialogue and consultation, since we all know that uh, the future president is unlikely to use the tweets in his running of daily domestic or international affairs. So we have to have some kind of, uh, so there is a prospect for setting up mechanisms or platforms for bilateral contact. This bilateral contact could be multi-level. As we all know that uh, Biden and President Xi Jinping, when they were vice presidents, they had very good contact with each other. And also between these two countries, there are various contact formats between uh, and, and among think tanks and between uh, uh, social organization and so on. So the, uh, of course, uh, there are uh, already some uh, scholars who, 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 who come to the media and talking about the priorities of the future organization or of the administration and so on. So I wouldn't uh, be going that far. Uh, I only feel that uh, for, the, for the future uh, administration, there would be uh, domestic concerns, international agenda, etc. There would be uh, uh, tasks uh, ranging in uh, pandemic control, economic re recovery, uh, how to mend the domestic racial, uh, to re-achieve uh, re the uh, domestic racial harmony. There will be international issues like uh, uh, international organizations, global trade, climate change, and so on and so forth. 
However, the, regarding U.S.-China relations, now we can see that the relationship is now in the most complex and grave situation since the establishment of diplomatic relations. So in the future, what we need is to maintain at the three points, maintain cooperation in areas where it is possible. For instance, it could be climate change, public health, cybersecurity, uh, in uh, cooperation and coordination in the uh, Korean Peninsula, Afghanistan, and other international regional issues. Of course, coordination and cooperation could be extended to WHO and the CPTPP, and etc. And there could, should be mutual respect of each other's core interest during the process. And the third point is that we need to set up mechanisms for effectively managing differences and avoiding confrontation. Final word is that uh, President Xi Jinping has already said, cooperation is the only correct choice for China and US. And for US and China, of course, we cannot expect the two countries to solve all the world's problems. However, it is indispensable for solving all mm -hmm. major problems. So now uh, what we uh, would like to propose is still coordination, cooperation, and stability. Thank you. Thank you. Coordination, cooperation, and stability. That's the key word coming from Ambassador Su's uh, notes. Uh, uh, you talk about uh, we need to avoid a downward spiral between the two largest economies in the world, China and the United States. And we see hopes of that due to the texture of communications existing between the two countries over the past few decades. And hopefully the trust between the leadership. Thank you, sir. Let me go to Ambassador of Italy, Ambassador Ferrari, please. Thank you, Tang Wei. And Thank you very much for, to uh, the Center for China and Globalization for inviting me and for including me in this extremely interesting talk. Um, I, I think that around the table, uh, we can agree that COVID-19, the pandemic, was the second black swan in our century against uh, globalization. Um, I think that post-COVID economic recovery will only be possible if we kickstart globalization. This entices a few things. First of all, an increase in FTAs, free, uh, free trade agreements. The reestablishment of the authority of the WTO, which also entices uh, proper international common standards. And this brings us to what we would call the level playing field. We need it not only on a bilateral scale, we need it on a global scale. And we also have to take in that China will represent in the next decade more than one-third of world growth. Um, it makes this uh, continent, this country, an indispensable, uh, an indispensable actor of the post-COVID recovery. And I will be very brief and conclude. Um, a lot of talk uh, has been going around about if this is going to be the American century, the Chinese century. I don't think it's either of those right now. But what certainly seems to be looming ahead is that the pandemic is swiftly moving us towards uh, a Pacific century, a century in which the equilibrium will move from what I would have called the, in the, what was in the, in the brief century, the transatlantic or the Atlantic century, will move us into a Pacific century. And I think we have to take that into consideration in all our efforts of post-COVID recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for your concise and precise uh, uh, notes. You talk about the world is not going to be bipolar, as some suspect it would be but rather it's going to be what you consider as a Pacific century. Uh, 
And also you talk about the important role of China and how others could work <coughs> with China in that regard. I want to thank you for that. Let's move on. And of course, you talk about the free trade agreement, which are very important and focal point of our conversation. Let's move on now to the Ambassador of France, Ambassador Billy, please. Well, good morning, everybody. This um, pandemic has already shown the negative impact of the erosion of uh, multilateralism and of the rise of uh, big power tensions on our collective ability to deal with these uh, challenges. We have never been so inter interdependent and yet, uh, as uh, Ambassador Chapuis just say, so confronted to the risk of fragmentation. As the President uh, of the French Republic, Mr. Macron, put it, put it in during the General, uh, UN General Assembly in September, there, may, there must be a new order which come out of this crisis, crisis and Europe should assume its responsibility in it. You have been asking what can we do together, and uh, I think what can we do together, we can't separate uh, global economy and other issue, and I will uh, just mention four challenges. Uh, the first one is uh, access to vaccination as a public good. We really have to participate, means financing multilateral efforts to make sure that all countries, including LDC, can access to vaccination uh, in the faster uh, and smoother way. Second challenge is the debt alleviation. Once again, uh, there is a real shock, and uh, I think our colleague from the uh, African Union uh, explained it better than I can do, but uh, debt alleviation and maintaining flow of financing toward LDCs, especially in Africa, is key for global recovery. Third one is um, what uh, Nicolas called about uh, the post-COVID economy. And of course, you won't be surprised that uh, as France, we are fully in line. We think of a green economy, a greener economy, a digital economy. And um, we have to put all our action, and especially recover the recovery plan, uh, greener. Fourth one is WTO reform, modernization. As uh, Luca just said, we need a real playing field. We need to tackle the main challenges. We need uh, WTO, which is functioning, to avoid a uh, new crisis in the future. I will be short, since I've been very talkative yesterday. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. <coughs> very important points. You reaffirmed uh, your colleagues' words and also put in new ideas, vaccination, and the flow of financing, international treaties, and also platforms such as on climate change issue, meanwhile WTO reform. Obviously, there are quite a number of global issues that we could work together that would create wonderful opportunities bilaterally and multilaterally. Thank you. Now let's move on to Ambassador of Canada, Ambassador Barton, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, again, it's an honor to be here. I have uh, three points I would just like to make. Uh, the first, just from a Canadian uh, point of view, we are a small trading nation. We rely on the international trading system, the multilateral order, and we have to fight very hard for that system to work or we won't be around. So it is, it is existential to us to have a well-functioning, rules-based multilateral order. Um, the second point I'd make is, we, as others have mentioned, the globalization is clearly changing. And I think as we look to the multilateral order, we have to recognize some of those changes. I just want to identify a number of them. Luca has mentioned one of the biggest ones, which I think is this Pacific century. Uh, I'm not capable of doing a presentation without a couple of numbers, so forgive me for putting some in. But if, 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 you, uh, if you look at, uh, at the weight of the world on a... Um, purchasing power parity point of view, in 2019 we had the crossover. So you had Asia x Japan representing 36.3% of the global GDP and North America, Europe and Japan representing 367 That was the crossover point. In 2025, Asia x Japan will be 405 and uh, North America, Europe, Japan 337 So it has shifted this way. And for a country like Canada that is, that is trading 75% with the United States, we got to get moving uh, and, 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 and be able to participate in that. There are other elements, obviously, of globalization that will change. It is, 
it is likely to be less than we've seen it on our traditional measures. Peak globalization in terms of goods and services uh, was in 2008. It's, it's dropped. Uh, but we're seeing rapid growth on the data side of trade. It is, it is growing at three-digit rates, even now with all the talk about the, the, uh, the decoupling. We also have technology, which has shifted the opportunity for small, medium-sized businesses in countries all over the world to participate more directly in large markets, and we're seeing that particularly with China, uh, given the development of e-commerce, for example, in Canada, we're now able to get many more of our SMEs connected to consumers, uh, and they, they never were able to travel in the first place, let alone with COVID. So that represents an opportunity. Um, we're going to see more resilience in supply chains. There's no doubt uh, they're not going to be as thin and lean as they were before. But I, I would just urge us all to remember reshoring equals subsidization. Reshoring equals subsidization. Uh, and just remember that in terms of the economic cost and what it means for the consumer. So again, globalization is going to be different. We need to ensure then that we have our multilateral organization, particularly the WTO, ready to be able to deal with the, the new challenges. So we are extremely keen on this reform. Nicola has mentioned that, others, everyone here. We've got to get uh, the WTO to be working its, its existential for us. Uh, but I also think we have to assure that every country that is doing it operates on a level playing field and walks the talk. There can't be the non-tariff uh, business uh, that, that's going on. People have to walk the talk, and we have to make it transparent who doesn't walk the talk to ensure that we can get the benefits for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador from Canada. Thank you for not only pointing out the significance of multilateral platforms and order and also the reform of WTO, but also acknowledging some good news out of the unpredictable future about the changing of where the economies are really flourishing, the locations and the new trends of technology and certainly the resilience we have observed since the very beginning of the COVID-19 around the world. Thank you. Now let's move on to Ambassador of Finland, Ambassador Suriyala, please. Thank you, Madam. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and a very good morning to you all. Um, so I come from Finland. It's a highly industrialized country, and uh, our economy relies heavily on foreign trade as well. So all these issues related to globalization and uh, global trade so are very relevant to us. And of course, today, uh, all eyes are on uh, Washington uh, today in this regard. So it seems that uh, President-elect Biden will enter the White House uh, uh, with a considerable good will from the international community. And the expectations are high. The tone from the uh, new administration in waiting has already changed from the incumbents uh, to one of working with allies to solve common problems. Expectations are especially high when it comes, for example, to climate issues. But um, issues like uh, WTO, which has been mentioned here, will be highly on the agenda. And um, optimistic commentators have already started looking forward to a new uh, WTO uh, Director General and resolution to the, uh, of the appellate body in pass. But um, that relief uh, should not blind us to the formidable challenges ahead. Uh, we would be wise to see this as a reprieve, but which could only easily be followed by a uh, worse situation uh, if we cannot solve the issues that uh, led to current problems. Um, global production and trade is dominated today by complex uh, supply chains run by private sector aiming to deliver high quality products at competitive prices to the consumers, which they are largely succeeding doing. So this uh, process is indirectly influenced by all sorts of government policies, for example, in infrastructure, skills, tariffs, but the effects of particular actions uh, is far from, uh, of these actions is far from clear. But um, it's therefore very relevant to observe what, what the governments do in this sense. Before uh, 2016, uh, uh, we might perhaps have accepted many of these uh, 
problems we have at, at the table now as normal tensions within the global trade systems. But um, I think um, uh, the politics have changed some of that. Um, it is uh, not only in the US where the public has been increasingly skeptical of trade. We have seen the same trend in, in Europe, for example. And therefore, it's, I think it's uh, important that we focus our uh, attention also to the public opinion and do something uh, together about that. It's, it's a fact that, uh, above all, global uh, trade politics need to be able to deliver results for politicians. And uh, just some uh, technocratic fixes at the WTO uh, aren't going to be sufficient, not least because they aren't addressing the underlying issues, just some of the symptoms. So in, in this spirit, we are very much looking forward to uh, close cooperation internationally on these issues. And uh, as I said, so trade matters for us and also the public opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador from Finland. Helping us to understand some of the priorities we need to work on and to deliver results, that's very crucial, as you said. Of course, there are two things that need to settle down. One is the U.S. presidential election, who eventually is the president. The other is how we can work within the WTO system with the new director general. Thank you. Now let's move on to Ambassador of Algeria, Ambassador Bukhalfa. Thank you, Madam. Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the outcomes of United States election are indeed of great importance for international relations and global economy. What has happened in recent years and the tension that has been installed in the relation between China and the United States will, in my opinion, remain. Beijing's relationship with Washington in the world structures its foreign and security policy. The reorientation of U.S. trade policy is structured around strategic competition with China. The Trump administration considerably accelerated the crystallization of the balance of power in the trade sectors, technologies, military, and security. Relations between the two Greece world powers are complex and marked by strong interdependence broken down into four essential areas economic, military, technological, and cultural. It is less a commercial confrontation than a geopolitical one. When analyzing global competition and tension between China and the United States that starts some years ago, a lot of analysts point out the risk of more effective confrontation and the world would prefer to not experience. Since the United States considers that the era of competition between the great powers have, has returned, and that China is a strategic competitor, while China sets long-term targets to reach a world leader position in several areas, and sees that two countries' tension have a structural origin, many observers point, point out an increasing risk fall in the TCD trap. American poli policymakers increasingly see the United States-Chinese rivalry not as a traditional competition between great powers, but a struggle between democracy and communism. Last July, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo gave a speech whose main purpose was to describe the tsunami and rivalry in ideological terms. He said, we have to keep in mind that the Chinese regime is a marxist leninist regime. Such rhetoric aims to delegitimize the Chinese government in the eyes of the American public and international public opinion by portraying China as the new devil a bad actor in international politics. It just not, it just not, just hawks like Pompeo who gave come to see China through an ideological prism. A wide range of establishment figures in Washington have come to believe that the real threat to the United States is not China's growing military and economic might, but Beijing's challenge, Beijing's challenge to the American model of political development and economic. I do not believe on a real confrontation between China and the US. The two countries' decision-making is very complex and involves many institutions and wise leaders that will manage and crucial bilateral issues in a manner to avoid war. Furthermore, furthermore 
I agree with several analysts asserting that there is no winner on the trade war between the two largest econo world economies. At the end, consumers, industries, and business in general will pay the hard cost. Nevertheless, the current situation is not irreversible. The return to win-win situation for the benefit of all world is still possible. The, recent, the main recent insights of COVID-19 pandemic remind everyone that the best ways the world have to address the challenges it is facing and during the pandemic and to overcome the severe, the severe economic crisis ahead related to sharing experience and are adopting coordinating action among the following. Strengthening of international cooperation, emphasis materialism and coordinated response, concentrated efforts on reducing the development gap between countries, protect our planet and preserve these resources in order to ensure the sustainability of economy well-being, especially for future generations. Finally, as an African, I would like to share with you two proverbs of the wisdom of our continent, Africa, that we must ponder in the, as they illustrated very well the challenges and concern development above the world is facing in the framework of the US-China relation. If you want to go fast, work alone, but if you want to go far, let us work together. And when two elephants fight, the grass below is always crushed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I love the African proverbs. They always <laughs> speak truth. And so are proverbs coming from various cultures. Great wisdom throughout history, I guess, we need to learn. And you suggest and strongly suggest that it shouldn't be geopolitics that's going to run in the world, but rather commercial and other kinds of interactions and cooperation that should be the key. You also sound the alarm of some politicians trying to demonize others while, tr while at the same time to legitimate one's own cause. That's not certainly the way to go. Certainly, you call on all of us to look at the bright side. The choices of consumers, the international cooperation we need to demonstrate through COVID-19 after learning the lesson. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. Now let's move on to the next ambassador, Ambassador Fletcher, coming from Australia. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Ten Wang. Uh, ambassador Su mentioned that there is no reason for euphoria now that the US election is over, but perhaps there is cause for some relief. Um, the Australian Prime Minister has congratulated uh, Mr. Biden on his election victory last week. We look forward to maintaining our close partnership uh, going forward with the United States during the next administration. Australia places top priority on open trade and investment for growth and prosperity, and we're committed to a stable and open global trading system. This system, underpinned by the WTO, has had a crucial role, or has a crucial role, in helping recovery from the economic shock uh, of COVID-19, particularly by maintaining open markets and keeping trade flowing. It is likewise important that countries live up to their WTO obligations and play by international trade rules. When trade is treated as a political tool, we all suffer. We hope for positive US engagement in the WTO as we work towards outcomes at next year's 12th Ministerial Conference. As we finalise the appointment of the next WTO Director General, as we seek reforms to improve the functioning of the WTO, and as we look to find a way forward to ensure a properly functioning appellate body. Australia itself has pursued a number of trade agreements, especially in our region, including the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, RCEP, and of course, TPP. These agreements are complementary and mutually reinforcing and Australia would welcome the opportunity to extend the benefits of such agreements in our region. We are aware of several economies that have expressed interest in joining the TPP, and we continue to engage with interested economies informally, although none has yet lodged a formal accession request. Australia would welcome interest in this agreement from any economy, 
including re-engagement by the United States. Australia would consider each accession application on its merits in coordination with the other CPTPP parties. We of course expect any new members to meet the CPTPP's existing high standards, including on issues such as agricultural market access. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Master Fletcher, coming from Australia. You talk about not to mix trade with politics. You also talk about the importance of uh, regional and international trade platforms, CPTP, CPTPP, RCEP, TPP, and also the possible engagement of the new administration in the US with uh, some of these uh, platforms. Thank you, sir. And of course, the bilateral trade deal between China and Australia. Let's move on to the Ambassador of Netherlands, Ambassador Geertz, please. Thank you, Wei, and congratulations to CCG for organizing this excellent forum. China's integration into the global economy uh, is one of the great economic success stories of the last decades. And international trade and a trajectory towards economic openness have benefited both China and the world. We want to work together with China to deepen our economic cooperation in order to deal with the great challenges of our time, food security, healthcare, a circular economy, and the energy transition we need in order to fight climate change. Our current rules-based system is under pressure relating to both enforceability and the fact that the current set of rules do not create equitable outcomes. It's more important than ever that the big trading blocks in the world assume their responsibility to ensure that the system functions properly. The Netherlands remains firmly committed to a rules-based multilateral trading system where conflicts can be solved in a fair and transparent manner within the framework of the WTO. Several colleagues have mentioned the necessity and the urgency to start with WTO reform and we fully agree with that. In order to sustain the positive impact of trade and investment, we must ensure reciprocity, create a level playing field, and safeguard national security where necessary. We are willing to engage constructively with China to ensure that countries and trading blocs benefit in equal measure from international trade. This also requires compromises from China and genuine implementation of reforms as others have referred to, walking the talk. In that respect, we welcome the progress that has been made between the EU and China in the negotiations on a comprehensive agreement on investment, but we're not there yet. The agreement should offer investors more predictability and ensure benefits for the European and Chinese economies in equal measure. We seek comprehensive, ambitious, and reciprocal results on issues such as market access, level playing field, and sustainability. The road to recovery from the current COVID pandemic is challenging, or will be challenging. And in view of those challenges, reciprocal and equitable trade relations are key to global economic recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Master, coming from Netherlands. Really appreciate it. You talk about your country supporting rules-based multilateral trading system and of course the enforceability of the rules. Meanwhile, uh, the promising China-EU investment treaty in the making, big hope for that, and also some of the bilateral cooperation fields you could have with China about food safety, about uh, circular economy, just to name a few. Thank you very much, sir. Now let's move on to Ambassador of Poland, Ambassador Jayakosti, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Madam uh, Tianwei. Uh, thank you, CCG, for organizing this uh, uh, great uh, event. Um, while thinking about uh, post a post-COVID world, we, we, we tend to guess how much of the pre-COVID one will remain. Uh, but unfortunately, with uh, COVID, things will be different, and there is no doubt that uh, the international economic cooperation will be affected uh, by changes in many ways. One of them uh, will be the relocation of some industries back to developed countries. A lesson learned by many governments and societies in the first half of this year 
uh, was that solutions we had at the time of the outbreak did not prove to be sufficient enough for all types of products. I wouldn't like to, to go uh, into details. Let me, let me point out one thing only. Uh, the prospect of relocation of the production of some goods is sometimes seen uh, as a step against globalization. I think that such an approach uh, is totally wrong. First of all, because it's not about globalization as such, uh, but about better and more efficient protection of local populations. Second, uh, investors from all over the world can take part in, in this process. Another important problem is uh, global trade architecture. Uh, and since our meeting is taking place in uh, Beijing, uh, let me point out uh, uh, the importance uh, of China's impact on, 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 uh, 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 in, in this sphere. China has been a major beneficiary uh, of markets opening uh, in Europe, America, and other regions. At the same time, China has been pursuing its own policy of opening up to foreign products, services, and investment. Today, this process has a 40 years long history, but has not been completed so far. Moreover, very much welcome declarations uh, about continued efforts to open up Chinese economy have recently coincided with the announcement of the idea of uh, double circulation. We know too little, and here I, I agree with uh, uh, Ambassador Chapuis, uh, we know too little uh, about this concept to make uh, comments, but uh, its practical implementation will have uh, a tremendous impact uh, on China's relations with the rest of the world. How to avoid uh, a scenario when uh, this situation turns out into a source of even more severe tensions in international trade than we have today? I think, and from the this is Polish perspective, Polish, uh, uh, Poland, a member, uh, a member country of the European Union, the answer is twofold. First, to complete negotiations with, uh, uh, of the comprehensive agreement on investment with the European Union. Second, together with the EU, to keep working on the WTO reform and on updating the organization's rule, rules. And uh, I believe these practical steps reflecting adherence to principles of multilateralism will cer certainly contribute to the global post-pandemic recovery. They will be also meaningful for the cooperation on climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, coming from Poland, Zajakowski. Thank you, sir. You once again talk about the rule-based international trade system and how important it is to get it working. And you also talk about how important it is to turn tension into opportunities on multilateralism through rules and through negotiations. I guess that's what we urgently need to do, hopefully, in the middle of the pandemic. Thank you. Let's move on to Ambassador of Spain, Ambassador Descaya, please. Thank you very much, Cheng uh, Wei, and thank, thank you very much for this invitation. Globalization has had many positive effects, but it has been particularly good for China. When China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, it represented 5% of the world's GDP. Today, it represents 16%. At the same time, globalization has had not so good consequences for other countries in terms of offshoring of companies, unemployment, and social problems. So we need to review some of the rules of the game which have, which have ruled globalization in the last few decades, especially in the fields of trade and investment in order to create a level playing field. This is what we are trying to do in the European Union with a comprehensive agreement on investment to which some of my colleagues have referred previously. And I know China, the Chinese government, is also very interested in pursuing this negotiation. Uh, we, do not, we do not believe that decoupling is a good idea, and in many sectors, actually, it is impossible. 
better regulation of areas where we have detected problems is a much better solution than decoupling. Uh, and particularly, we have to fight against the danger of protectionism, which in history has had very negative effects, especially when coupled with nationalism. Crisis, as has been said, create new opportunities. And now we have the opportunity, to, after the COVID-19, to try to establish a better pattern of growth, a growth based on green economy, digital transformation, strengthening of health systems, social issues, and which has to be inclusive. And we have to remember that the pandemic has had very negative economic consequences in the developing world. So we need to mobilize the resources to resume the positive trends of previous years in the developing countries, trends of eradication of poverty and trades of widening of the middle class, particularly in Latin America. In order to do that, we have to reform the World Trade Organization, we have to work to reform the World Health Organization, we have to work on the G20, and all that all opens a very wide array of opportunities of good cooperation between China and the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for pointing out seeking solutions is much better than just complaints. And also thank you for pointing out the progress needs to be inclusive, and especially with the developing country's future in mind. And of course, you set out a huge task list for all of us, uh, WTO, WHO, G20, and the list goes on. Thank you. We hope we'll be up to those tasks. Now, let's go to the next ambassador. Ambassador coming from Colombia, Ambassador Monsalvi, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tian Wei and CCG, for this invitation. Um, yesterday, I attended uh, the webinar with uh, Ronnie Chan, uh, Xu Wong Yao, John Thornton, Tom Friedman, and former dean of uh, Harvard Kennedy School, Graham Allison, from where I'm an alumni, so I have always paid a lot of attention to what he says. And I most, more or less agree with them and with many of my colleagues in that uh, with a new Biden administration or government from January 20. Uh, U.S. will be back to multilateralism. multilateralism. I think prior climate, climate accord, WHO, nuclear proliferation, and probably WTO, with some reforms in mind. Uh, these are broad areas for cooperation, uh, tackling urgent problems the world faces, uh, such as a common strategy to overcome the pandemic uh, instead of blame games and also more move forward with common measures regarding climate change. And from then, new trust can be built as John Thornton suggested yesterday also. However, regarding some areas of trade and technology, I agree with Professor Allison that Biden probably will remain tough with China, although in a more smart way. Uh, US and probably many developed and developing countries will continue focusing on supply chains and will attempt to diversify or near shore as Dominic said the term before, uh, the new fashion term, uh, the, the sources to be less dependent on particular countries in key areas of their economies. Now, regarding Latin America and Colombia, since I'm the only Latin American uh, representative here, uh, let me be like a kind of a spoke, spokesman for my region. We are one of the regions worst hit by the pa pandemic, by COVID-19, both in the health uh, perspective and also in the economic terms. And we, for the next following years, we will need a lot of cooperation, open trade, and physical and technological investment. And in this sense, we shouldn't be forced to choose sides. I think we, instead, we need to keep opening opportunities where we have complementarities. And let me explain. Uh, historically, U.S. and European Union have been the main trade partners for most of Latin American countries. And they remain in many countries, such as mine, Colombia. But in the last couple of decades, China has grown to be uh, partner number one for many countries in Latin America, such as Brazil, Chile, and Peru. And for many of us also, it's also had become number two. So now, China and the US are both number one, number two, and EU, uh, European Union are also number one, number two, number three. So the three air big areas are our main partners. Uh, and also, additionally, during the last decade, uh, 
the largest infrastructure investments in Latin America have been made also by Chinese companies. So we need to be open and we need to keep all the, all the opportunities coming from all these regions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I love your pragmatic attitude to work on things that we could work on right now, which is, of course, about uh, the fight against the pandemic cooperation and hopefully in the future, near future, on the climate change issue, as they could be quite very much linked with one another. And I want to thank you also to pointing out whichever administration coming into being in Washington, they need to get back to work, particularly to work on the global governance issue. Thank you. And uh, all the best to the great friends in uh, Latin America, certainly your country. Now, I have to say, I'm really impressed. Every gentleman speaking here abide by the rules. And this is a rule-based discussion, I guess. And it is also a democracy, as every one of us agree to these rules. So I would take the liberty to go to the second round of our discussion with also the preset rules. That is, we have a quicker uh, interaction because uh, we earlier already mentioned on some of the specific challenges that we have globally. Why don't we roll up our sleeves and get to work? Um, as you all beautifully illustrated, it's much better to seek solutions than to complain. And you have done exactly what you have preached. So let's do the challenges and let's see the solutions if it's possible. One of the things you all mentioned about is the pandemic. How can we create with efficiency cooperation in that regard? That could, in a way, pave the way for the other issues we're also facing internationally. And every one of you seem to point out to uh, climate change issues. And also the fact that the so-called geopolitics is bothering us so much, we can't get to work as a result of that. And the unpredictability of some national politics is also in the way. How can we overcome them together? I know it's too much to ask because ambassadors are representing their countries. But even with that limit, or shall I say, with huge power that you have in your hand in uh, being a bridge, let's work on those issues. So I would call on another round, if possible, to let every one of you to speak more focused on these points. Is it okay? I ask for your permission. Okay, how? Okay, thank you. Now, who would like to go first? I wouldn't go with the flow anymore, with the name sequence, but rather, who would like to go first? Ambassador Chapias, yes, be my right hand gentleman and very proactive in answering questions. You have, unfortunately, one minute, one minute and a half the most, everyone. I'll be extremely brief. I made just two, two very short uh, comments on COVID in China. First one is that there is a commitment, public commitment by uh, China's authorities to make the vaccine a public good. Meaning, in our opinion, a global public good, not a China public good only. Well, uh, we'd like to see to know more about it, how it will go. We welcome China into COVAX facility, which is a distribution facility of vaccines. But for the time being, there's not enough transparency on what is going to happen in the next few weeks. And uh, so we'd like to see more about that. If China wants to cooperate, it needs to do more. The second thing is international mobility. Uh, China is closing again its borders, like end of March, to every European. This is not going to go well in Europe. The image of China is suffering from that. I understand the need to protect China's population from COVID, but sorry, the virus is no more European than it was Chinese. So if you stop mobility, you stop everything. You stop trade, you stop business. We have too many issues today of people being stuck, students, European students who cannot come back to China. So if China wants to be a COVID partner, it needs to reopen its borders now. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. The virus is not anybody's. I'm sure you understand science. 
and therefore, how to make that balance, it's a very important question. We need to all work on that, as nobody knows the way forward. I'm not explaining on behalf of China. I'm not representing China. I'm just putting a note over here. Uh, there are two other gentlemen raising their hands, uh, Ambassador Billy and Ambassador Su. And then anyone want to speak, uh, please raise your hand so I can see you in the process. Well, quickly, I would like to underline that our president already um, congratulated Joe Biden as well, because I think it's a fair point to make sure what are the results. And um, on the, we had the issue of solution and complaints, and I wanted to uh, put forward the idea that we have also to have the right diagnostic about the problem of today. And uh, the diagnostic is also that uh, there is things that should have to change. The statu quo is not possible. There were things that were possible when uh, China was a developing country. China is not a developing country anymore. And so we need a real playing field. And if we don't have the right diagnostic, it's very difficult to move forward. Thanks. Thank you. Ambassador Su, and any other ambassadors? Well, thank you very much. Now, the question is, what is globalization? Actually, globalization is a process of reallocation of resources for achieving the maximum of efficiency, as Madam Tian just mentioned. And we are fellow uh, global villagers. We have one planet to share, one future to share as well. So if, we, if the global villagers want a peace, stability, development, a health, and prosperity, cooperation is the only way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I see Ambassador from Algeria earlier also raising your hand, please. And Ambassador of Spain later. Thank you. Let me uh, to be a little bit uh, pessimistic. I don't believe uh, that uh, we will have a better world in the future because the president elected new American administration rolling from next January will implement surely a moderate strategy and will adopt new vision that will be more helpful for the US economy recovery and they will be more involved in military artillerism. But in the same time, they, may, they will maintain a hard and demanding stance toward China. Let me to remain or some reminds an article published by Mr. Biden in Foreign Affairs in March 2020. He said, China represents a special challenge. I have spent many hours with its leaders and I understand what we are up against. Mr. Biden met Mr. Xi Jinping in 2011 and 2012 eight times. China is playing the long game by extending its global reach, promoting its own political model, and investing in the technology of the future. The United States doesn't need to get tough with China. The most effective way to meet that challenge is to build a united front of US allies and partners to confront China. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Ambassador of Spain, please. We would love to uh, give some time to our observers, uh, for example, from India, from United Arab Emirates, and from uh, uh, other countries. Uh, you can also raise your hand if you want to speak at this moment, but everybody will have to be brief. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. All those problems we have mentioned are extremely complex. The only way to solve these problems, to try to solve these problems, is by to build political confidence. Politics are crucial. There is now a new opportunity between China and, and the United States after Biden's election. Uh, there is also a very good political dialogue between China and the European Union. But in order to build political confidence, we have to see that the issues which concern us, which worry us, are addressed. The, the, the agreement on investment is a good example of that. And the issue raised by Ambassador Chapuis of mobility would also be a very important one. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And I understand from my colleagues that uh, Ambassador of India would also like to speak a few words. Ambassador Misery, please. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, very few words indeed. Uh, I think a number of my colleagues have referred to uh, the need for uh, the reform of 
the WTO. It's actually not just the WTO, but the entire institutional architecture of world governance that needs reform because these institutions do not reflect the reality today. They reflect the reality at the end of the Second World War. So uh, as we go forward uh, into a new era, uh, we do need to look at uh, reform very, very seriously. Uh, one other point which I think got missed out, uh, I think, in all the priorities that were mentioned by a number of uh, my colleagues here, uh, that needs to be addressed is inequality. Uh, as WTO reform gets underway, we need to not only think about free trade and opening up markets and market access, but also addressing the issue of inequality. We should remember that development was a very, very important plank in WTO discussions uh, when they were going on. They must return to the center of our focus. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's a very important note that you mentioned. Uh, certainly, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, among them, there are a lot of issues regarding what you have touched on, and of course, some we haven't got a chance to touch on. We hope in future conversations. Uh, and uh, I have uh, Prof Ambassador Ferrari also want to speak a few words. Oh, just, um, just to stand my ground, and, but I do, I do agree very much with uh, Dominique, what uh, Dominique and Vikram have said uh, earlier. Um, I still think what we need in the very short term is to jumpstart the globalization, to remove barriers, to increase the international standards. As, as Dominique well put, put it, we need an oiled, multilateral, rules-based trade system. This goes for Italy very, very much. We are a trade country. We need to get back to protecting free trade. Um, this implies FTAs, uh, a global level playing field, and uh, uh, a, a strong reinforcement of WTOs and other similar organizations which manage world trade. Thank you. Do we have any other gentleman or lady want to speak up uh, for a conversation? If not, let me wrap up by having one last request. <laughs> for every one of you, both the panelists who are having lengthy uh, answers, and of course, our wonderful observers as well, to speak one word. Well, we are getting even shorter, the answer. One word will be that word that would solve many of the problems, ladies and gentlemen, you mentioned today. That one word. If I come with every one of you, just one word. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Ambassador Gertz, you want to speak uh, about the earlier answer or about this one? OK, let me go with uh, the from the very beginning, a master in India, and then we go this way. Is it possible? Thank you, sir, for your gracious time. Please, uh, Ambassador of India. One word, please. Set a good example for everyone. Understanding. Thank you. Political confidence. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a phrase. It will pass. OK, thank you. Trust. Think. Equality. Cooperation. That was my cooperation. <laughs> right now, I'd say vaccine. <laughs> Democracy. Cooperation. It's getting difficult. Uh, sustainability. Confidence. Direct. Okay, no more cooperation. Trust. <laughs> Solidarity. I'm totally in long line with you. Solidarity, definitely. Uh, if I may have three words there, it's uh, for the next year, it is the year of peace and trust. Three. Year of peace and trust. Yeah. I heard a lot about cooperation, dialogue, trust and also hard work, I guess. So that is uh, uh, pretty much the underlying meaning of everything you just said. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of our co-organizers, uh, CCG and CGTN, for your candidness and also for your friendship. Thank you so much. Let's give them a warm round of applause. We really appreciate it.